Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our e-seminar series on translational biomedical engineering. Uh, uh, we are very happy and excited to uh, host Professor Mohammad Kasaima, uh, an associate professor from uh, uh, New York University Abu Dhabi with us today. He will be talking about lab on a chip uh, or lab on a tip microfluidics uh, for cell analysis and manipulation. But before we start, I'd like to make a few housekeeping uh, uh, notes. Uh, first, if you have any questions during the presentation, uh, please use the ask a question box uh, uh, to share your thoughts and, and ask us your uh, questions uh, or provide us with your feedback. Also, uh, uh, we have a poll uh, available for you to, uh, to participate and share your thoughts and feedback with, with us. Uh, also, I would like to mention that uh, our uh, next speaker is Professor Maud Gorbe from um, University of uh, Waterloo. Uh, if you want to uh, receive the most up-to-date information about uh, her talk and then also uh, the upcoming uh, very exciting talks, please follow us on Twitter. Our handle is TransLBME. You can also email me and Human if you have uh, any questions about this e-seminar series um, or if even you want to nominate a speaker for, for, for these series. Last but not least, uh, I would like to thank our um, uh, sponsor, Montreal Transmed Tech Institute, uh, who has been with us since almost the beginning of this um, uh, e-seminar series. Thank you very much, Montreal Transmed Tech, for all your support. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, invite Professor Kasaime to share his uh, uh, screen with us. While he's sharing his screen, I'd like to uh, start with a very long uh, introduction uh, for, uh, for Mohammed's uh, uh, achievements. Uh, I know Dr. Kasaime for a long time, and I've been a big fan of his, his research, especially this uh, lab on a tip technology that he's going to talk about. And it's a pretty amazing work. Uh, that I've always been uh, been jealous of, and he has. Uh, I've never told him before. Uh, uh, Dr. Kasame is, is uh, uh, recently becoming an. Uh, be, he has recently become an associate professor of mechanical and biomedical engineering at New York University um, Abu Dhabi, uh, in the UAE, and uh, also he is affiliated with the mechanical and aerospace engineering department at Tandem School of Engineering, uh, New York uh, University in, in, in New York. He established. The Advanced Microfluidics and Micro Devices Laboratory in 2014, and his current research interests include developing microfluidics and MEMS devices for point of care diagnostics. Recently, Dr. Kasaima was awarded the Technology Innovation Pioneers Award during the uh, TIP 2020 Summit. Prior to joining uh, 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 New York University in Abu Dhabi, he was a postdoctoral research associate at uh, MIT and a research fellow at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kasema completed his PhD degree in biomedical engineering from McGill University, where I first met him, and I learned from him a lot. Uh, he received several prestigious awards and fellowships uh, at that time, including the uh, uh, NSEC postdoctoral fellowship uh, for those of you who are not in Canada. This is a very prestigious award uh, who I think is given to uh, like 10 percent of uh, PhD graduates in, in Canada and also the Alexander Graham Bell Graduate Scholarship, which is another prestigious award. Uh, Dr. Kasemia's research has been published, um, uh, has published many, many papers in, in journals, including Nature Communications, uh, small advanced materials technologies and lab on a cheap. Uh, he has delivered more than uh, 33 keynote and invited lectures at national and international conferences. Uh, Dr. Kasame is actively involved in organizing several local and international conferences, uh, uh, include uh, conferences, uh, 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 and currently serving as a co chair of the uh, NYU Biomedical and Biosystems Conference Series and uh, the program chair of the International Conference on Manipulation, Automation, and Robotics at Small Scales for Mars. Dr. Kasame is serving as an associate editor with the IEEE Nanotechnology Magazine, a topic editor with the Journal of Biosensors, and a review editor with the Journal of Frontiers in Bioengineering and Biotechnology. He's also a, a, an editorial board member of Scientific Reports at the uh, Nature Publishing Group. 
Uh, with that, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dr. Kasame for accepting our invitation. Uh, welcome, and the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Akbari. Thank you, Mohsen. Um, yeah, it's very nice to, to meet you after all of these years, and the truth, actually, I learned from you a lot. But, well, let's keep that our little secret. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Savoji, as well, for the invitation. I'm very glad to be here today. Um, and welcome to uh, all of the people attended this seminar. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm located in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. It's 8 p.m. It's my dinner time. I'm hungry. But hopefully, I can give the enough energy uh, for this very interesting seminar series. I'll start my timer. I'll try to finish on time. Today, I'll be talking about lapona tip microfluidics for cell analysis and manipulation. So my good friend, uh, Mohsen, asked me to uh, add the information of my journey. And of course, I have to obey. So I have, I'm starting with this uh, slide, just summarizing my education and my expertise. Um, and my experiences. So I started studying mechanical engineering, like mechatronics back then in 2000 was very interesting uh, and exciting world. So I did that in Jordan University of Science and Technology. Uh, I'm originally from Jordan. And after that, I was lucky enough to move to Canada. Um, I did my master's degree in mechanical engineering in Concordia University. That's a university in Montreal. So there are two English speaking universities in Montreal, Concordia and McGill. So after finishing my uh, master's degree in Concordia, I moved to do my PhD in biomedical engineering in McGill University. So the biomedical engineering department in McGill University is the first uh, biomedical engineering department in Canada. And it is under the Faculty of Medicine. So my PhD was with Professor David Yanker. So those in the field of microfluidics, they must know him. And there in McGill University, where I first met with uh, Professor Mohsen Akbari. During my PhD, uh, of course, like during my PhD, I was supported by NSERC. And also during my PhD, I was supported by the FQRNT. It's, it's like the NSERC funding agencies in, uh, agency in KEPIC. I was supported by them to do my internship at Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School, first for six months and then for another two months later on. And after finishing my PhD, I moved to Boston and I did my postdoctoral fellowship uh, in MIT and Harvard Medical School. So in MIT, I was in the lab of Professor Rohit Karnik uh, in collaboration with Professor uh, Jeff Karp at Harvard Medical School and Brigham and Women Hospital. And again, there I was meeting and interacting with uh, Dr. Mohsen Akbari. So uh, for those in Canada, you are lucky to be there. Uh, you can really build a very interesting educational career. And for those outside Canada, I will highly encourage you to uh, do your studies in Canada. Plus in NYU Abu Dhabi, of course, as I will show you. So for those in Canada, I don't know uh, if you see my, uh, my video or not, but we have Tim Horton. I'm drinking Tim Horton now. So you can, for those in Canada, you can come and to Abu Dhabi and yet enjoy uh, some Tim Horton coffee. So if you don't know what is Abu Dhabi or the United Arab Emirates, I'll try to show you where we are on the map. I wonder if you can spot us. If you want to spot us, you need to turn the globe a little bit, go to the Middle East. This is the United Arab Emirates. The city of Abu Dhabi is the capital. And New York University Abu Dhabi is located in Saadiyat Island in the capital of UAE, which is Abu Dhabi. Perhaps most of you are more familiar with Dubai. So Dubai is less than two hours drive. I would say like 90 minutes drive from the campus of NYU Abu Dhabi. I'm currently sitting in my office actually over here. All right. so. Visit us at NYU Abu Dhabi, at least virtually. If you are interested uh, to visit us virtually, you can go to YouTube. There is NYU Abu Dhabi campus tour. Um, it's a bit outdated four years ago, but still you can enjoy the tour and learn more about NYU Abu Dhabi. 
So we are one of three main campuses of the Global Network University of New York University. The first campus is New York University in New York. So the engineering campus of New York University is in Brooklyn and the other uh, faculties, including the medicine, are in Manhattan. So the NYU uh, University in New York is around 190 years old. And the second campus is NYU Abu Dhabi. So we are located here in the Middle East, as I just showed you before. And we are 11 years old. And the third main campus, the one is in Shanghai. And it's around nine years old. So all of these small dots over here are showing countries um, where our students are citizen or coming from. So we have students from around the world. And as an example, fall last year, one year ago, NYU AD welcomed its 11th class of around 490 students coming from 82 different countries and six continents and speaking more than 75 languages. Of course, English is the common language among all of them. All right. So who are we? We are the AMM lab, the ML lab, the Advanced Microfluidics and Micro Devices uh, Laboratory. We are located in the Experimental Research Building in NYU Abu Dhabi. If you ever pass by the Middle East, uh, you are more than welcome to visit us. Uh, so this is a photo of the group one year ago. It was January uh, 2020. Uh, it was not yet very serious with the COVID-19 pandemic. So you can see us just like in a relaxed way, putting our masks down. But of course, a few weeks after that, things heated up and people were not allowed to do that in public. Um, so we are our efforts. This is my actually acknowledgement slide that I will repeat by the end, but always I love to start by acknowledging the people who do the work and the institutions supporting us and hosting us, as well as the funding agencies. So visit our lab, at least virtually. So this is a, a, a YouTube video that was uploaded uh, maybe one, two weeks ago uh, as a part of the Microtas uh, conference 2021. So this is the lab sneak peeks featuring three labs. We are lab number three. Um, so at least you can walk in uh, inside our lab and, and meet some people who will tell you what they do and what kind of equipment and research we do. So I invite you to visit this YouTube uh, if you're interested. So now proving that scientists and professors can just communicate some stuff other than science. Hopefully I proved that to you. Now let's get serious and get to the science. So today I'm talking to you about Lapuna tip, uh, microfluidics for single cell analysis and manipulation. So perhaps not all of you are familiar with what microfluidics is. So I thought I'll give you just a very quick crash course on what is microfluidics. So microfluidics is the field that deals with precisely controlling and manipulating fluids at the micrometer scale or the submillimeter length scale. It depends and we can debate that, but nowadays microfluidics can be few micrometers uh, in the size scale. But the field evolved uh, maybe like 15 to 20 years ago, just considering the micro scale feature. So when we talk about microfluidics, speaking about the length scale, so this is the length scale of microfluidics ranging from few micrometers to few millimeters. And when we look at the volume scale, we are talking about few picoliters or less. It could be few uh, femtoliters up to few milliliters, depending uh, how long you are running ex of your experiments and how much fluids you are processing. And here you can see, like in compared to human hair, micro needles, micro reactors, you can compare the length and the volume scale and get some feeling of these microfluidic devices. So now why microfluidics and how microfluidics? Uh, in general, uh, microfluidics is very important in engineering applications, in material science, most 
importantly also in biological and clinical applications and in chemistry, as well to uh, work in microfluidic devices, you need some skills and knowledge in engineering, in material science and surface chemistry, as well as in biology and chemistry in general. So this slide I'm showing you here is serving two purposes. The first one is where you find microfluidic devices. The second is what kind of fields and knowledge you need to work in micro to be able to work in microfluidics. So the field of microfluidics is a highly multidisciplinary field. Why should we care about microfluidics for biomedical applications? Since today my talk is about single cell analysis and manipulations, so we are focused on biomedical applications. But why should we develop microfluidic devices for biomedical applications? And the answer, because of the low sample consumption. So as you see in the image over here, for example, instead of going to the hospital and going to the lab or laboratory in the hospital and giving up few milliliters of your blood to do some tests with microfluidics. Now you can do such tests and experiments only with a drop of blood. And the best example of that, a glucometer that all of us can walk into pharmacies and buy it. So it's the low sample consumption and the small footprint. So these devices are very tiny. So this is one dirham coin and this is a device next to it so those are very tiny of course until today most of microfluidic devices are actually not necessarily lab on a chip but there is a lab around the chip but those are only experimental setups and once uh, these devices are fully developed they will be integrated with different um, automation different components for automation and then it would be really a lab on a chip, as you can see over here. So the vision for microfluidics is to serve uh, the future uh, futuristic lab on a chip that you can turn a whole lab inside a small chip. Exactly how CPUs, microelectronics computers evolved since the 1950s until today, computers started to be in big rooms. Nowadays, you have a very powerful computer in your pocket, which is your smartphone. So now making things smaller and smaller, you can do parallelization and reach high throughput experimentation, leading to putting a whole lab inside a small chip. And of course, when we talk about microfluidics, there are several unique physical phenomena in the micro domain, such as the laminar flow. So those of you in mechanical engineering, perhaps you remember from your undergrads, uh, Reynolds number, uh, if Reynolds number is less than 2000, that means the flow is laminar, but now in microfluidic devices, in most cases, a typical Reynolds number in a microfluidic device is even less than one. So you may call it a super laminar flow. This is very powerful and will give us a lot of uh, capabilities to design very unique and innovative experiments for biomedical applications. But yet the laminar flow could be problematic because mixing is very hard. So the mass transport is only limited or carried by only diffusion. So mixing at the micro scale is a bit challenging, but there are several tricks and techniques in microfluidics to elect mixing within micro channels. And also capillary forces, as you may imagine, so as water go up the 10 meter trees in Canada, uh, for example, uh, that's by capillary flow. So such phenomena can be harvested and utilized at the micro scale. So you can run your experiments in an autonomous manner. And electroweighting, of course, among others, is kind is, is one of several unique phenomena in the micro domain. So now why microfluidics for cell manipulation and separation? why we want to do cell manipulation and separation in the first place, because biosensors and lab on a chip, some applications would be in pathogen detections, such as the, uh, uh, some chips uh, nowadays being developed for COVID-19 or the, or the virus detection. Uh, so biosensing and diagnostics for tissue engineering, uh, for also single cell analysis, for biomimetics, drug screening, rare cell isolation, etc among others so there are a lot of applications that you really need to manipulate manipulate cells and separate them for uh, different reasons and microfluidics is the platform of choice uh, for such applications so today what i'll be talking to you 
since I'll be talking about the Lapuna tip uh, or the multiphysics props for biological and clinical applications. Uh, so first, I will show you a few what I call classical microfluidic devices, which is a channel, closed channel, and the fluids are inside the closed channels, just to make you aware of the different configurations of microfluidic devices. And after that, I'll start talking about the Lapuna tip devices, which the samples are decoupled from the fluidics. So first, I'll show you some examples of microfluidic technologies. There are not Lapuna tip. You may call them Lapuna chip, if you wish, um, that we developed and currently developing in our labs. So the first example I want to talk to you is a microfluidic chip that we developed to isolate circulating tumor cells from prostate cancer patients' blood. So I will touch on the concept of CTCs or circulating tumor cells later on when I talk about Lapuna tip. But this is one of the examples that we were developing a chip and running three chips in parallel. This chip is uh, functionalized with some specific antibodies called EPCAM, and this chip is functionalized with another set of antibodies called PSA, that's the prostate-specific antigens and prostate-specific membrane antigens. So we would take a blood sample from prostate cancer patients and then run them in the devices and try to isolate these cancer cells flowing in the patient's bloodstream or circulation. And after that, so what's unique about these chips we develop, um, so after capturing the circulating tumor cells, you can disassemble this chip, peel off this PDMS layer, and end up with uh, the captured circulating tumor cells on a flat glass substrate where you can approach it with an AFM, atomic force microscopy, and try to do some uh, nanomechanical analysis of these captured circulating tumor cells for the purposes of uh, phenotyping, nanomechanical phenotyping. So the, 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 to, to make the, the long story short and simple, it's like when you go to the market aiming to buy a tomato, uh, usually you pick these tomatoes one by one and put them in your bag. And if you touch a tomato that is very soft, you may not like to buy it. If you touch a tomato that is sticky, you will exclude it from your bag. So you are as a human being trying to mechanically analyze and categorize these tomatoes you are buying, trying to understand how old, how good it is. So we're trying to do the same thing. So after capturing these cancer cells, we come with the atomic force microscopy, try to understand their nanomechanical properties, hoping that their nanomechanical properties can one day serve as a biomarker of their aggressiveness. So this is a published paper last year. In case you like to learn more, you can just visit this paper. So another technology we developed, it's uh, uh, um, a chip uh, that can isolate single T cells inside, so a single T cell inside a rectangular microwell. And the purpose of this, we wanted to do an immunophenotyping of these uh, uh, T cells uh, for biosensing application and to be able to uh, uh, to be able to detect several cytokines released from these T cells we had to develop the microwell to be in a rectangular shape and to be able to position these cells exactly in the center of the rectangular microwells, we had to develop some techniques which we call it the air plug, uh, in situ air plug formation and release. And by the end, we were able to control uh, the, a single cell per rectangular microwell that is positioned centrally and then after that, we did the cytokine detection. This is a published paper last year. You can uh, visit, it, visit it if you like. So here the sample is inside closed microchannels and the previous one as well. So the captured circulating tumor cells are inside the channel. Of course, we managed to disassemble the device later on, but we introduced the blood inside the closed microfluidic channel. So another example that is not a microfluidic channel, but I would love to share with you today is the paper-based 3D cell culture and cryopreservation. 
Uh, so we started using paper platforms, engineering them, and then culturing cells in 3D inside. So this is not new. So the group of George Whiteside at Harvard University showed this, perhaps, I'm not sure, at, at least 15 years ago in, in a PNAS paper first. But here what we are bringing is like after in doing the 3D culture inside the paper, we cryopreserve it, which means freezing it at very, very low temperature. And after storing it for a few months, when we throw it and put it in culture, we show that these cells survive the cryopreservation inside the 3D paper platform. So we published an array of papers around uh, this technology. The first one was an advanced biosystems. The last one this year, uh, it was lab on a chip. Visit them if you're interested. Okay, so this is another platform that I would like to talk briefly about it, which is uh, an electrically triggered conviction for particle aggregation. So we developed this technique for the purposes of biosensing. So we can, if you have a sample with very diluted low concentration of cells or biomolecules, but for here we were focused on cells, you can put a drop of blood, a drop of your sample, which could be drop, uh, blood, and using some electrically tri triggered conviction, elect the central aggregation of these cells within the droplet. So as I said, for biosensing application as well as for tissue engineering application. So this is kind of an open chip. We did these experiments without putting the sample inside the closed microfluidic channels. Another quick example of a microfluidic chip that I did in collaboration with uh, Professor Robin Lee. And why I bring this up here, because early on, I mentioned to you that I did an, and during my PhD, I did an internship in Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. And I worked with Robin where he was a postdoc uh, there back then. And then he moved to Pittsburgh University and started his lab. I moved to NYU Abu Dhabi, started my lab, but still we are collaborating and publishing papers together. So sometime, you know, you don't expect that you will make a lifetime collaborators, uh, but that happens. So now after showing you a few examples of classical microfluidic devices, I want to move to the lab on a tip or the microfluidic prop principle. So now, again, I'm repeating here, this is a classical microfluidic chip. You have closed channels, you push your sample or cells inside, this is not necessarily always an ideal situation. Sometimes you have neural cells, sometimes you have stem cells. The hate to be enclosed inside tiny channels is very hard to culture them inside. Sometimes you are dealing with tissue slices and it's very hard to plug in a tissue slice inside tiny micro channels. Sometimes uh, a biological reaction happens inside your chip and you are interested for post-processing uh, steps. You're interested to access this cell you captured or these cells you're growing inside the chip, and that's very challenging. And therefore, the concept of the microfluidic prop evolved. So the first time the, the name of microfluidic prop was coined in 2005 in, in a paper published by David Yenker and Emmanuel Delimarche in Nature Material. Emmanuel Delimarche is an IBM Zurich. Back then, David Yenker was a postdoc there, and then David moved to McGill University, and then I joined David as a PhD student, and then I started developing these microfluidic props further. So this is the basic concept of the microfluidic prop. So your cell culture or your surface to be processed is decoupled from your fluidic delivery. So for ex in, the, in the example of the cell culture over here, the cells are sitting in Petri dish, happy inside an incubator at the time of the experiment you bring the microfluidic prop from the top so it is exactly like when you bring your pen to the paper to write on the paper but here the only difference that this microfluidic prop is contactless so it doesn't really contact the cells but the processed fluid through the microfluidic prop will expo get exposed to the cells or the cells will get exposed to this processing injected microfluidics. So now, if you have only one capillary or say one channel and you inject fluids, then the fluid will 
diffuse everywhere within the cell culture. But the microfluidic prop concept solve this by including another aperture that apply aspiration or suction. And the flow rate of this aspiration is higher than the flow rate of the injection. And given this gap between the tip of the microfluidic prop and the bottom surface to be processed, given this gap is small enough, then you can achieve what we call the hydrodynamic confinement. Everything you inject in this gap will get successfully captured back and aspirated. And therefore, if you look from the bottom over here, so this is the injection aperture, this is the aspiration aperture, you can see the green processing fluid over here is totally confined. Nothing is leaking to the surrounding media. We see this tear shape. And what's interesting about this, now if you start playing with the ratio of the flow rates of the aspiration to the injection, you can so easily change the size and the shape of this tear shape. So it is as we are having virtual walls that dynamically can be dynamically um, uh, modified just from your computer that you're controlling your syringe pumps. So the advantage of the microfluidic prop technology is contactless technology can work in scanning mode. So this microfluidic prop is connected to an XYZ micropositioner. So by controlling the XYZ coordinates from the computer, you can scan across this cell culture and target specific areas. So with the MFP, the fluidic delivery is decoupled from the cell culture and it can be easily integrated with other technologies such as the AFM because you don't really have to disassemble the device. All you need to do is just to take the Petri dish and do further and you can get have you can get access. You have full access to whatever cells you captured or processed. So during the years, the microfluidic prop was shown for single cell analysis, writing on cells, patterning proteins, um, processing tissue slices. This is brain tissue slices. This is processing breast cancer tissue slices, doing some other multipolar configurations that I'll talk about now. So during my PhD in David Yunker lab at McGill University, I developed the concept of the microfluidic prop further by involving more than only one injection aperture and one aspiration aperture. And this, in this specific example here, we have four apertures, two for injection and two for aspiration. As a result, you get a flow pattern that we call the microfluidic quadrupole in analogy to the electrostatic quadrupoles. So to cut the long story short, since this is old news, this was first published in 2011 in Nature Communications. Uh, so we did this to get the stagnation point here at the center, which is uh, free from flow. That means it's shear free. There's no shear stresses there. We want to study uh, cell chemotaxis there because this configuration can easily generate concentration gradients. as you can see over here. So we started generating concentration gradients and studying neutrophil chemotaxis. Neutrophils are a type of white blood cells. You have it now patrolling in your blood. Whenever you have infection, they will be the first guys to respond to the infection by following a concentration gradients. So they will go from low concentration to high concentration of uh, chemoattractants such as IL-8 or it, they could be repelled from some specific um, other chemo repellents. So here I'll show you this video, a single neutrophil, how it's crawling and going, moving toward the higher concentration of IL-8. So now we use this uh, MFP technology. Remember, it's contactless and it can work in a scanning mode. So what we did, uh, we were challenging neutrophils with the concept of the donkey with the carrot. So when the cells, so here I'll show you a stationary gradient. And this video is we are tracking on time the movement of individual neutrophils from low concentration to high concentration. Now this concentration gradient at the interface is being stationary. We're injecting a solution of IL-8 over here. We are injecting just buffer from here and aspiration from this aperture and aspiration from the other aperture. And as a result, the concentration gradient is formed across this interface 
from low to high to high to 100% concentration of IL-8. So after studying the neutrophil response under stationary gradient, we started moving the gradient. So as these neutrophils are move, moving towards the higher concentration of IL-8, the IL-8 concentration gradient itself will move, for, will move further and further, and we wanted to see if we can just guide these neutrophils to keep moving. As you can see over here, so this interface is moving in steps further and further. So these experiments were performed uh, by the end of my PhD studies, but then we had to do a lot of analysis and writing the paper, which I did way later on, and David Yenker was very patient with me, uh, and finally it was published in 2018. So now for all of these microfluidic devices, we were doing them using photolithography and using bulk etching of silicon wafers. So here I'm talking about the regular or the classical way of doing microfluidic devices, which is basically the way MEMS devices, the microelectromechanical systems are done, which the whole techniques are borrowed from the microelectronics industry. So this wasn't very flexible and not easy to innovate devices and to integrate the microfluidic props with uh, several other features. So also, I, I should acknowledge that the IBM in Zurich, uh, they're still working on this and they're developing scalable um, and modular uh, microfabrication methods, such as one of their published papers in Langomer in 2011, where they showed they can develop a vertical microfluidic prop, as can be seen here. But of course, you need great uh, microfabrication facilities, such as the IPM Zurich. But moving here in NYU Abu Dhabi and wishing to continue this stream of work, we had to find other alternatives. Now, after giving you the very fundamentals and physical concepts of the microfluidic prop, the push-pull configuration, and the hydrodynamic confinement, I will be moving to talk about 3D printed rapid prototyping, 3D printed printing and rapid prototyping of microfluidic props. So the story started in 2016 uh, when a bright PhD student joined my lab, Ayola Premo. Uh, so he did this his work during his PhD. He graduated last year. Now he has his own startup company. It's not related to microfluidics, but uh, we're hoping him all of the best with that. So the intersection in 2016, Ayola Premo joined the lab and we had a new 3D printer in the lab, our first 3D printer. And uh, discussing with him the, micro, the concepts of the microfluidic props and having the 3D printer, we thought, what if we try to 3D print microfluidic prop? Would it work? Would it be biocompatible with cells? Uh, let's see how it goes. Uh, so in a few days uh, after that discussion, Ayola came back to me with his first prototype. So thank you to the 3D printer and to his talent as well in mechanical and CAD design. So in that microfluidic prop, he even integrated reservoirs. He integrated plug and play uh, ports to plug in the tubing for the injection and the aspiration. And he th 3D printed the, uh, the prop holder and he integrated the microfluidic prop with a twist lock connection inspired by just the light pulp, how you connect them. So it was just an amazing microfluidic prop uh, that can be produced in a week time yet he showed it can work. So now to remind you, uh, this microfluidic prop got two apertures, one to inject fluid, and the other one is to aspirate. So the aspiration flow rate is higher than the injection flow rate. As a result, some of the surrounding medium will also be sucked with the aspiration aperture. The gap is very small. The bottom substrate is our sample of interest. So a monolayer of cell culture in this example. Now you see the green, all of the injected green is being sucked back and nothing is leaking. And here is a photograph of how the MFP is coming down to a monolayer of cells cultured in, in Petri dish. And here are the plug and play uh, ports and tubing connectors that are going to the syringe pump that we control from the computer to control the flow rates of the injection and the aspiration. Here I'll show you a video how this very prop 
is labeling cells in the scanning mode. So you can see this is the tear shape, the hydrodynamic confinement, and we are writing A, B, C, D on a monolayer of cells cultured, cultured in Petri dish. And we are labeling these cells with dye eye. It's a fluorescent marker uh, that can label cells, la uh, 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 can label uh, live cells because these fluorescent molecules will penetrate through the membranes of the cells without harming them. Now, this work was published in Scientific Reports in 2018, and I should acknowledge here that we were wrapping up the paper, and then I was talking to a very good colleague from University de Montreal, uh, uh, Professor uh, Thomas Gervais, and we were talking about what I'm doing in the lab, and we were surprised that they were 3D printing microfluidic props, just like us, and they have different design, they use different 3D printer. So at that point, uh, we decided to put our work together and write uh, a single paper or a joint paper between both of us. And I would call this it's like a last minute uh, collaboration. And it was a very successful collaboration. And since then, uh, the group of uh, Thomas Gervais, they have been developing advances in the concept of the microfluidic props. Uh, during the last two years, they published uh, very interesting papers, and I recall here one in Nature Communications and one in PNAS, so you may go to their website and read more if you're interested. So now having or proving that we can successfully 3D print uh, microfluidic props, uh, we wanted now to start innovating these 3D props and integrating these uh, microfluidic props with several uh, techniques and features. Now I'm coming to the topic of the sequential cell separation and 2D printing using 3D printed microfluidic prop. So why uh, sequential cell separation? Just here to remind you, this is the same slide I showed you earlier. So cell manipulation and separ separation important in several biomedical and clinical applications. So now, uh, 3D printing means you just design whatever chip or device you want in SOLIDWORKS or AutoCAD in 3D, and then you change it to an STL extension file, and then you upload it to your 3D printer, and you press print. And depending on your device, say like between 30 minutes to a few hours, you will have your device. So now the whole world of 3D is open to you, and you can just imagine, innovate, and print. Uh, so now when Ayola and Anoop uh, joined forces, they wanted to integrate the concept of dye electrophoresis. It's a very known concept and heavily used in microfluidic devices for cell separation. Dye electrophoresis, it's these forces uh, that um, are uh, formed when you apply non-uniform electrical fields to dielectric materials. Cells are dielectric materials. Uh, so now Different cell types will have different DEP properties. Therefore, you can apply DEP forces and separate cell A from cell P, depending on their properties, electronic properties, as well as their sizes. So now we wanted to integrate DEP or dielectrophoresis with the concept of the microfluidic prop to show that we can separate cells within an open microfluidic system. Remember, now our cells uh, they are not inside channels, they are within an open microfluidic uh, setup or environment that is in the gap between the prop tip and the bottom substrate. So now this is the microfluidic prop that uh, Ayola developed. Uh, so you can notice this microfluidic prop is of a multipolar configuration. Uh, so we have a central injection aperture and five or six, in this example, six outer aspiration apertures, you may wish to flip it, make the outer apertures, all of them for injection and the central one for aspiration, or design it based on your taste, depending on the application you are aiming for. So here, what really integrates the DEP or the dielectrophoresis is the array of the humps over here. So every hump over here is kind of a pointy electrode. So after 3D printing this device, what Ayola did, he coated the whole device with a very thin layer, 50 nanometer, uh, thick layer of gold. So you see the first golden microfluidic prop ever here. Of course, this is not very expensive because the gold layer is very thin. So now having this as a as the um, 
as the working electrode and the bottom substrate over here is a glass slide coated with ITO. ITO is a conductive material, but transparent. So we need the transparent material here to be able to image what's going on in the gap and connect it as the counter electrode. So now having the setup and injecting suspension of cells from the central aperture over here and aspirating from the outer apertures and activating the DEP, you can see all of the cells will get captured, arrested by the dielectrophoresis forces at the tip of the electrodes. So this is a cross-sectional scanning electron microscope showing the tip of the electrode. We call them the micro humps, inspired by the, leg uh, the legendary uh, multi-hump uh, cam, being inspired uh, from Abu Dhabi and the camels uh, in the UAE and uh, San. Because camels are very famous here and people, it's, it's part of the tradition. So here I'll show you a video. So again, the injection, the suspension of cells is injected from the central aperture and all of these are doing aspiration. So you can see all of the cells just pass from injection to aspiration. But when we activate the DEP, you can see the cells get stuck at the tip of these micro humps. And when we turn off the DEP, they will get washed again. So now by optimizing the parameters of the DEP, you can separate cell A from cell P, B, where cell A will get arrested at the, at the tip of these microelectrode humps, while cell B will keep the journey being carried by drag forces of the fluid and get aspirated. So now after the separation of the cells, we showed that we can do sequential cell sorting and patterning, where you activate the DEP, you arrest and capture the cells of interest, and you keep the aspiration functioning that will wash all unintended cells to the aspiration aperture, which is the waste outlet in our situation over here. So here, all of our cells of interest are attached or arrested at the tip of the humps, other cells are being washed. And then what we can do is to stop the DEP forces, just stop the AC signal. And these arrested cells, separated cells, will just be dropped into the bottom substrate by uh, gravitational forces, just by segmentation. And therefore, now you can separate cells and pattern them on the uh, on the bottom substrate and depending on how many apertures of aspiration and injection you have and how you use them you use which to inject and which to aspirate you can create uh, special or specific patterns of these separated cells and deposit them to the bottom substrate so remember the microfluidic prop can work in the scanning mode so in this video what i'll be showing you that this microfluidic prop is processing a suspension of cells and capturing at the tip of the microelectrodes only the green cells and then releasing them to the substrate and then moving, scanning across the substrate to a new place and doing the same. And you end up with patterning uh, an array of separated cells. All right, so of course, these patterns need to be really far away from each other because if you try to do them next to each other, the pattern cells over here are still not adherent to the bottom substrate and they will start being affected by the aspiration fluoride. So they were, you will uh, encounter crosstalk between the pattern unless you do some surface chemistry, you make a special bottom substrate that they will be more sticky and adhesive to the cells. So now I'll move to uh, another application or another lap on a tip device where we used it to do a multiplex isolation of circulating tumor cells. And perhaps I'm running out of time here. I'll try to go quick. So now I talked at the beginning about circulating tumor cells and I told you these are, maybe I did not tell you, but circulating tumor cells are cells that they leave the primary tumor by way or another, they don't like the primary tumor. They manage to leave it 
and squeeze in to reach the bloodstream and then they circulate with the bloodstream and by way or another they decide to stick to the wall of the vessel at some specific point and then they transmigrate this wall and then they go into some invade some new organ and they make a secondary site of the tumor and this is what we call metastasis so now usually um, for people uh, diagnosed with cancer uh, or suspected to have cancer, uh, medical doctors will ask them for tissue biopsy. So they will go to that organ or tumor in, in a surgical manner, take a sample from that tissue and do a pathology analysis to test if that is malignant or non-malignant tumor. Of course, now uh, this tissue biopsy is um, is harmful, not available in all hospitals, cannot be performed, say, like on a weekly basis or monthly basis. Therefore, uh, doctors cannot really monitor uh, uh, cancer progression, except on, by other means, could be imaging and blood analysis. But now the concept of circulating tumor cells and the concept of liquid biopsy, uh, so the concept of liquid biopsies in part based on the concept of circulating tumor cells that if i know circulating tumor cells these cancer cells are circulating with the blood and if i take a sample say one milliliter or five milli milliliter of the patient blood and if i have some means to capture these cancer cells to study them they should by way or another represent the tumor so i can study the progression of the tumor just by taking blood samples which is way less invasive than tissue biopsy itself. So what's the challenge about the concept of circulating tumor cells that they are very rare in blood. So when we talk about one milliliter of blood, uh, we are talking about uh, millions of white blood cells, billions of red blood cells, and only very few circulating tumor cells, ranging from less than 10 to maybe hundreds. So they're very challenging to get grasp of them and isolate them is just like trying to find the needle in a haystack. However, microfluidics contributed heavily to this field and the story, I believe, started in, in, in a paper in Science magazine uh, by Abraham Stroke uh, being working with George Whiteside at Harvard uh, University. Now Abraham Stroke is a full professor in Cornell University. So they developed a device that you can elect mixing inside microfluidic channels. Remember I told you that mixing is hard inside microfluidic channels. Later on, uh, around 10 years or eight years later, um, Shannon Stott, working with Mehmet Turner, again at Harvard University, they utilized uh, this herringbone concept to uh, isolate circulating tumor cells from blood samples. Now, Shannon Stott, she has her own lab at, I believe, Brigham and Women Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And I think she's continuing this work. Now, when I did my postdoc at MIT with Rohit Karnik and Jeff Carr, also we utilize such a device uh, to isolate circulating tumor cells from bone marrow cancer patients. Uh, so this is published like four years ago. You guys can refer to it if you wish. But now when I came to, uh, to NYU Abu Dhabi and Mohammedin Dili Orman joined our lab, uh, so we started developing these chips for prostate cancer, uh, for the isolation of circulating tumor cells from prostate cancer patients. And this is the same slide I showed you earlier where we try to do nanomechanical analysis of circulating tumor cells. But in 2017, when we were showing that microfluidic props can be easily 3D printed, and when another brilliant uh, PhD student, Ayub uh, Galia, joined my lab, we wanted to integrate the herringbone concept, the herringbone micromixer, with the microfluidic props so we can start capturing circulating tumor cells again in an open microfluidic system because once you capture the cells, you can take off your microfluidic prop and get full access to your captured cells for nanomechanical phenotyping, for staining, for culture, for whatever you want. Because now you are, culture, you are capturing cells in an open microfluidic system, not inside the chip. 
And that allowed us as well that the bottom substrate can be functionalized with different antibodies. So for the reason of chemically or immunochemically phenotyping these captured CTCs. So I will not spend much details. So this paper was published a few months ago in Advanced Materials Technologies. So I'll show you this video shortly. Uh, but here is a, a microscopic view of the different stripes of the antibodies. So here is an EPCAM antibodies control, meaning there's no antibodies over here. Antibodies of PSMA, which is the prostate specific membrane antigens and PSA, the specific, uh, uh, the prostate specific antigens. And then the microfluidic prop, the herring bone microfluidic prop, we call it, it was scanning and processing blood across these different uh, stripes of antibodies and trying to capture prostate uh, cancer cell line versus breast cancer cell line. And we could show that the breast cancer, the MCF7 breast cancer cell lines were only captured on EPCAM because they don't have the uh, prostate specific antigens, but the PC3 representing a prostate cancer cell line can be seen in the three stripes, but nothing in the control few, uh, uh, except few non-specific binding. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go fast, I guess. So here is a video showing how the microfluidic prop is processing the blood sample scanning across different streams. Now, we did this with clinical uh, samples, sample blood samples coming from uh, prostate cancer patients from a hospital in Dubai. And I should acknowledge the medical doctor over here, Dr. Farhat. And we could show that we can capture single circulating tumor cells as well as clusters of circulating tumor cells. Some clusters were around 50 cells, which otherwise impossible to capture using the closed chip microfluidic devices because they will just simply clock block that uh, microfluidic uh, channel. And we could show that uh, the samples coming from patients with metastatic behavior, they have way higher circulating tumor cells than those with localized prostate cancer. And we could show that the count of the circulating tumor cells captured on the PSMA uh, antibody stripes can be linked to the cancer grade. So please visit the paper if you uh, are interested. So now the last, uh, but not least, I want to talk about today is the concept of the non-contact multiphysics prop, which is a miniaturized form of the microfluidic prop integrated with electrical components for electroporation and electropermalization. So now again, Ayola and Anoop uh, once successfully showed that 3D uh, MFP microfluidic props can 3D printed and can be integrated with electrodes and humps for dielectrophoresis cell separation and patterning. We are lucky enough to have access to the Nanoscribe 3D printer. It's a two photon uh, polymer photopolymerization uh, 3D printer, it's state of the art, and you can really achieve very, very small microfluidic features. So here I'm showing you the 3D printed device. So the previous 3D printed device, we were talking about few centimeters by few centimeters and the aperture was few hundreds of micrometers in diameter. Here we are talking about way scaled down microfluidic prop where we have the side scale of it is a few millimeters and the apertures less than 50 micrometers. And these humps, the tip of the humps, it could, uh, we could reach a few micrometers. So I like the hedgehog. So I say this is inspired by the hedgehog. And these are now not micro humps, but micro spikes. So now what we do after localizing these micro spikes atop of cell of interest, we can apply our electrical signal and electroporation or electropermalization will happen. So these cells will open nanopores on their, uh, on their membrane. And as a result, now my processing fluid, if it has some uh, molecules, I can push these molecules inside the cell. And when I stop my electrical signal, these nanopores will seal. And that's how I, we can transfect single cells. And also the other way works. So through these nanopores, some of the content of the cytoplasm of the cell 
will leak. And if I can collect it from my aspiration aperture, then I can do analysis. And that would be a single cell biopsy, the concept of biopsying single cells. So a few months ago, this work came in small. So you can go and check it if you're interested. So what's interesting now about the hydrodynamic flow confinement, that by changing only the flow rates, I can target only few cells or single cells, let's say, to few cells, to hundreds of cells using the same device and during the same experiment, just by playing with the uh, flow rates of the injection and the aspiration and the ratio between them. So here I'll show you a video that we are writing on a monolayer of cells cultured, cultured in Petri dish, where we, we are here delivering a non-permeable fluorescent dye that will never go inside the cell without the electropermalization. So you see we're writing NYU over here. And again, this is different from the previous um, video I showed you. In the previous video, we were injecting cell tracker, which is permeable to the cell membrane. But here we are injecting, I don't recall, I don't remember the biomolecule name, but it's impermeable. But because of the electropermalization, the nanopores on these cell membranes are opening up. And this is kind of an alien ship coming and exchanging some stuff with individual cells. So uh, we can have multiple micro spikes. We can have multiple apertures. We can achieve multiple transfiction. I don't have time to go through that. Uh, but also, as I stated to you, now instead of pushing the stuff inside the cells, we can retrieve stuff from inside single cells, which we call them the single cell biopsies. Most of the work done by Ayola, but now Sam, a postdoc in my lab, he is continuing the work. So you can see here we are lysing the cell completely by the electrical signal and sucking all of the cytoplasm and doing some qPCR after that, trying to do some transcriptomic analysis. Or we can do incensional biopsies where you can do few uh, biopsies, not only once and the cell will still be alive. Also, we showed that we can do a single whole cell tweezing where we can target cell and then by some dual heating and trypsinization, disassociate single cells, remove it and suck it in the aspiration aperture and deliver it to somewhere else. So now what I'm hoping that I showed you a lab on a tip microfluidics for single cell analysis and manipulation where I showed you uh, we can uh, do single cell uh, chemotaxis, we can do single cell biopsy, we can do cell separation or sequential cell separation and patterning. We can isolate circulating tumor cells or any other rare cells uh, based on antibody-based uh, capture within an open microfluidic system. We can transfect cells and we can manipulate cells selectively. So now, uh, if you're interested to learn more, and if it happened that you're joining Microtask this year, uh, we have several papers this year. We have a talk about fluid tip. Uh, I did not talk about it today, but I you, uh, graduated a few uh, months ago, by the way, he's, he's a PhD now. Uh, he will be giving an oral talk about fluid tip for advanced atomic force microscopy. We have um, a COVID-19 related poster and we have uh, here, Sam will be talking about the single cell biopsy using the multiphysics microfluidic probe, showing some of his recent results that I did not show today. Also, we have a poster about the cryopreservation of 3D tumor model, and I think it's running for best poster award. So let's wish we send the best of luck with that. Uh, Ayub also is talking about how he 3D prints atomic force microscopy. I did not talk about this today. And also, Pavitra will be talking about um, some uh, lamp assay in a paper-based device for the COVID-19 detection. And also, Sam will be talking about an open microfluidic chip for diabetic patients, where we get blood samples from diabetic patients, we isolate their RBCs, and then stretch these RBCs using the EP forces, trying to understand their uh, mechanical phenotypes. I did not talk about it today. Again, Thanks to the people who do the work, thanks to the institutions hosting us and to the foundations funding us. 
Thank you so much for the organizers of this very interesting seminar, and thanks for all of the audience. Thank you so much, Professor Kasaime, for this interesting and exciting talk. And uh, you and your team develop uh, many uh, platform platform technology for uh, that has potentially, you know, clinical and translational applications. And this is what. Uh, maybe you can stop sharing so you can see us. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, so so this is uh, the question from my colleague in Trans Montreal Transmet Tech, who works also with Tuma uh, on, on his technology in uh, uh, the, 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 the company, a startup company that Tuma has. Axel is asking about uh, your technology and if you are collaborating with industry to bring these technologies into clinical practice? Yeah, yeah very interesting question. Um, I mean, I would say like we are not really in favor of industry collaboration, given that we are in, in the Middle East, you know, we don't have many industry partners. I know the UAE is working hard and trying to evolve in this but not yet. Uh, I would wish that we can identify industrial partners and try to take this more to a practical level that mm -hmm. really can benefit patients, not only just living inside the presentations and, and research labs. Exactly. But it has yeah. potential. It has potential. And Axel, as a technology developer, developer in Transmit Tech, he has this... Uh, you know, I to see the potential in any technology. So that's why probably is ask, asking. So Mohsen uh, is asking, could you please explain a little bit about the method which is being used to create the, the pressure for injection or the vacuum for aspiration? Yeah, very good question. So, uh, so far, most of microfluidic props are being, so as, as I said, there, there are IBM Zurich, they're driving a beautiful, uh, beautiful advances of, of the microfluidic prop. They have many interesting papers during the recent years. I, and I recall maybe last year, a beautiful paper, Nature Biomedical Engineering, where they show that they can do immunohistochemistry patterning. Like they have a tissue slices from breast cancer patients. And instead of, uh, of doing some pathology or immunohistochemistry, of on the whole slice now using this hydrodynamic flow confinement they can spot different um, different uh, antibody staining and they can understand the spatial heterogeneity within the tissue slice itself so it's a beautiful work i advise people interested to go and read it and another group is Thomas Gerve another uh, in, in montreal and another group is david yanker in montreal and my group as well and there are some other uh, groups doing very interesting work as well so most of these there we, we use uh, syringe pumps uh, so it's fluid flow control or controlled by fluid flow but of course you can use as well pressure controllers so you can control the pressure and i know there is a, a microtas abstract i don't know when maybe in 2000 something uh, when david yanker was still a postdoc in ibm zurich I know they tried to combine capillary-driven microfluidics with the microfluidic prop, but they never talked that further. But I know at least there is a single microtest abstract that tried to drive the injection and the aspiration by capillary effect. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much. That's very interesting. Uh, there is a, uh, another question from Azhar. Uh, He's saying that a very interesting concept of detecting CTC, uh, circulating tumor cell using AFM. How would you envision to translate it to clinical application? Yeah, very, very interesting. Azhar, uh, good to have you here. Um, so it's, it's the whole concept of liquid biopsy. So several, I would say tens or hundreds of labs around the world are trying to develop the perfect microfluidic technology to isolate circulating tumor cells from blood samples. It's the concept of liquid biopsy. Of course, the concept of liquid biopsy is not limited to circulating tumor cells because some technologies, they look at microRNAs or exosomes or some other molecules, not a, a whole cell itself. But what excites me about capturing a whole cell, 
that if the cell is living, perhaps you can culture it, you can grow it, you can assay it, you can check the DNA and the RNA of these um, cells. So it's, it's like having the, 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 the real messenger that really transfer the disease from one side to another. Um, so the whole concept of liquid biopsy or CTC capture that they can complement tissue biopsies. So let's say if the medical doctor will recommend tissue biopsy every six months, perhaps between tissue biopsy to another, the patient can go through liquid biopsy on a weekly basis. And based on the number, say, of how many CTCs you can capture, perhaps you can understand, uh, perhaps you can understand how the tumor is progressing, how it's responding to that specific drug. And what's also exciting about capturing the whole cell that you can do drug testing. So this really uh, resonates very well with the concept of precision medicine or personalized medicine. So patient A and patient B, both they have prostate cancer, but for sure, uh, not for sure, they will not respond the same to drug X. So especially nowadays, chemotherapy is a kind of combination of drugs. So it would be brilliant if you can isolate these CTCs and test different combinations of drug on these CTCs coming from that patient and identify the best kind of combination for that patient, which could evolve because these cells or cancer uh, develop resistance to drug. So maybe on a weekly basis, you decide what's the best combination and then you deliver that to the patient. Thank you so much. Uh, I know this is uh, your night and you want to relax and have dinner. So I have one question. Uh, one uh, question from my own field. I'm coming from organ and chip and tissue engineering. And <clears throat> in uh, tissue in uh, organ and chip, we combine microfluidic with tissue engineering. We come up with the organ and chip. So our problem is always the PDMS that is not the perfect material absorbing the the or absorbing the the biomolecules on top of that and. The other materials, like the other uh, alternative, uh, they have other, you know, disadvantage that <clears throat> they, we cannot do imaging and other stuff. For example, this 3D printed uh, microfluidic that you show us, it's not transparent, but it's very perfect in terms of microfluidic. So what would be your suggestion in terms of material of choice and also fabrication uh, for organ on chip applications? Sure, this is a very, very interesting question. I mean, having 3D culture and cryopreservation and paper based, we're trying to push that field in the market where, where we, we filed the patent. And, and during the years, you know, I had very good student and we tried to kind of make a startup. Still, we are in the progress of that. We don't have a startup. Again, being in, in the Middle East is not really great for that, but I can tell you, uh, the region is evolving very quickly and what is hard today could be super easy tomorrow. So I'm full of hope. Uh, so I would tell you paper-based uh, organ on a chip devices, but yet imaging is a challenge, as you said. Uh, so it's not transparent papers. It's like a 3D uh, network of uh, cellulose fibers. It's not easy to do confocal imaging inside, but um, but yeah, go, coming back to the microfluidic probe, we don't have cells inside the microfluidic probe. So all of the action happen at the tip or between the tip and the bottom substrate. Um, so I'm not sure. I mean, something maybe we can brainstorm together how if we can utilize the microfluidic and open microfluidic system uh, in the field of organ on a chip. Maybe that's something we should just brainstorm about. Exactly. Thank you so much. You know, I thought maybe we don't have any other question, but I see that people are getting excited, put the question. I, I, I can wait. It's okay. You can keep going. Yeah, I'm sorry to I keep you a little bit. I think no David, uh, Professor Yonker is asking, congratulate uh, for all of these exciting creative development. I was wondering if you had thought about application for a special transfection tissue engineering, for example, looking at cell-cell interaction and constructing designer environment. I just want to say hi, David. Thank you for coming and joining us. Yeah, yeah. is that is that David Yanker? If 
because I see David here without family name. Yeah, me too. I'm just, I'm just guessing. Uh, maybe it's David. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's 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 a very very nice question, and and most likely it's David Yenker because he always have tough and very interesting and inspiring questions. From the so question, that, from the question, I noticed <laughs> because he uh, he's always asking very tough questions. So yeah, he's coming. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. Here we go. Very interesting question, David. Uh, to be honest, we are considering to look at that for this single cell biopsy. So the dream is, so now we are trying to biopsy single cells from a monolayer of, uh, of cell lines cultured in Petri dish. Uh, and, and the argument that if we can successfully do that, our next step would be to work with tissue slices. Uh, so now uh, thinking about the work of the IBM Zurich, uh, so they come with the tissue slices and they do this staining and they study the spatial heterogeneity using staining. Now, my dream, I don't know if it will ever come true, that we come to tissue slices and we start biopsy, biopsy doing biopsy, that's, that's a hard word to put the ING with it, doing biopsy uh, and scanning, do, doing like targeting regions and doing the scanning with that and trying to study the... the uh, the heterogeneity of the trans the transcriptom trans transcriptomics of that tissue slice. So that's the dream. But of course, we can also look at transfecting tissue slices. But let me tell you, since David, you are expert in this. So our challenge now, we did not try it yet, but the first challenge, we foresee that for all of these cell lines and single cell analysis we do, we culture these cells in an ITO um, coated glass slide because we want the counter uh, uh, electrode. So the electrical field will go from the tip of the microfluidic prop to the bottom substrate and the cells are in between to do the electropermalization. So now having a thick tissue slice that is not ideal and may not work. So now we are thinking if we can achieve patterning the electrodes on the microfluidic prop itself so we can get rid of the bottom electrodes. So now the, the bottom substrate will be just a regular Petri dish or a regular glass slide or a regular micro titer plate, while the active and the counter electrodes are both on the microfluidic prop itself. Thank you so much. Uh, Benjamin has another question. Are you able to identify by staining uh, visualize and capture a single cells in the slide of paraffin embedded tissue using your microfluidic probe or fresh tissue slide? Yeah, so we did a very good question. Uh, so David is saying, do it. Yeah, sure, we will we'll try. So very, very interesting question, Ben, ben Yamin. Um, so in my lab uh, and in my previous uh, expertise, I did not use tissue slices. I know in David Yanker lab, they used uh, tissue slices from brain. I don't recall details. And they studied the diffusion of some molecules within the brain tissue slice. And I know in IBM Zurich, they actively using tissue slices from breast cancer or from cancer patients. So they do the, the paraffin embedded tissue slices. And I guess they do the freshly obtained tissue slices as well. And yes, they do the staining, but not at the single cell level. I don't think they're interested at the single cell level when you talk about tissue slice, but maybe that would be their next target. Great. Thank you so much. There is another question from Vahid, which is more about designing his own chip. He said that we found a difference in thermal conductivity of CTCs and other components of blood, such as uh, white blood cells and come up with the idea to isolate CTC using thermophoretic uh, force. We designed a microfluidic chip and developed the numerical model and heating um, blood to just one degree centigrade. Our numerical model confirmed the idea and, uh, uh, and isolated CTC. Could this method of isolating CTCs be practical in your opinion and what could be a challenge for making such a chip? Yeah, this is this is very good uh, comment. I I never heard of this before. It's it's very innovative. Uh, it's worth testing, I guess. And I would see that, uh, you know, if if it works for him in a classical microfluidic uh, device, it should work with a microfluidic probe. 
because you know when we have this arrays of microelectrodes and we apply the AC signal, dual heating happens. So we can do uh, heating, uh, and that perhaps will help in separating uh, cell A from cell B if that really works. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have no clue, to be honest, to comment further on this. But it's very interesting. Yeah, so I think uh, he should try. So uh, Morteza has a question about different methods of uh, isolating CTCs. Uh, he's asking what is the difference or advantage of your technique over the inertia method that uh, our, our colleague in, for example, Australia, uh, Majid, is making. Uh -huh, so uh -huh. What is your advantage of uh, the advantage of your chip over the uh, inertia yeah. method? Of course, Majid, the work is, is, is brilliant, you know, with these spiral microfluidics and they can, and they have really high throughput, so they can really process 5 ml in, in I don't know, in a few tens of minutes. It's brilliant. I mean, every technique has good and bad. So now the, or not bad, weaknesses, I would call it, the, the criticism usually of antibody-based capture method for CTC isolation is that not all cells would be expressing uh, these kind of um, antigens on their surface, especially when you consider EPCAM, because the the expression of EPCAM is proven to be lowered during the EMT transition of these circulating tumor cells. But that's why we are looking at the multiplexing capability now. So having the antibody-based CTC capture within an open microfluidic system is allowing us to have a bottom substrate functionalized with whatever recognition receptor you wish. So in our work, we looked at EPCAM, PSA, PSMA antibodies. You can easily include uh, other antibodies such as HER2 to target breast cancer or some other antibodies specific to other cancers. Now, with, with, um, with advances in, in nanotechnology, someone may include some graphene layers uh, to be on as, as the bottom uh, substrate or, or some nanotubes, or I don't know. Uh, so it, it, so having it in an open microfluidic system, open up uh, a new whole uh, array of ideas that people can now integrate it. But as I said, in general, the antibody base is being criticized that not all cells are necessarily expressing X type of antibodies. Now the, the centrifugal microfluidics or the, what we call it, not the centrifugal, the spiral microfluidics. The spiral microfluidics, yeah. Yeah, uh, the Dean's flow and the, you know, by the hydrodynamics uh, physics of the flow and the cells you can separate, which, which is brilliant. But now if you think, you compare, so for example, the antibody base, so we were able to characterize the patient profile based on where more cells are captured. Is it on the EPCAM stripe or the PSA or the PSME? So we can have two in one, for example, try to, to uh, phenotype these cells to be able to have an idea about the profile of the, of the patient itself by identifying what kind of antibody, capture antibodies were the best in capturing the circulating tumor cells. Of course, there are a lot of other techniques to capture CTCs. DEP dielectrophoresis is one of them. And also there are like the mechanical traps and some, some converging microfluidic channels that will separate cells based on their size or based on their deformability. Thank you so much for your answer. Now, I actually pass the podium to another expert in microfluidic who is a bit silent here. Dr. Akbari, please go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for so much, Professor Kassi. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks, thank you, man, and thanks, uh, Mohammed, for your very interesting and inspiring talk. Uh, as uh, I promised before we start the presentation, your talk, I promised you that I won't ask you questions uh, because it's late night. Uh, so I will, I will chat about uh, you know these technologies uh, offline. I have some ideas that we can we can talk about. Uh, but I, I know it's, it's late and uh, I just wanted to thank you and also remind everyone that uh, our next speaker is Professor Matt uh, uh, Gorbey from uh, University of Waterloo. Don't, don't miss that uh, talk as well. Thank you. Thank you so much to all of you, all of the interesting questions. Thank you, Mohsen. And Mohsen, I'll see you in a few days. You will deliver a seminar at our engineering seminar series. Sure. Remember that. And yeah. I hope 
all of you guys will be able to visit us in UAE, and I'm hoping that I'll come back visiting Canada. And the general advice, like Canada is a great country. And thank you all. And uh, come back and have the real Tim Hortons here. Sure, I will. <laughs> I will make you do that. <laughs> See you, yes, Mama. Take care. Have oh, Sebastian night. is here. Sebastian. Hey, oh, sir. Yeah. Take care. Take care, everyone. Bye.